And hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Ask the Expert event. It's a series of events that we've been doing here at GBH since the beginning of the pandemic. And we've been finding it's great to have you joining with us in, in your hundreds, literally, for these interesting conversations with some of the folks that we know best from our radio and television offerings. And today, of course, we're going to be learning about travel with uh, an expert indeed and the television host of Samantha Brown's Places to Love. And she has many, many divergent places to love. I'm Brian O'Donovan. I'm host of a Celtic Sojourn here for tonight's event. And I'll be moderating, meaning that I'll be the travel cop, basically taking your questions and chatting with Samantha, which I'm really looking forward to doing. Thanks to everyone joining us today, including our Leadership Circle and Ralph Lowell Society members, of course, your support is extraordinarily important to, the, to our work here at GBH and more extensively uh, with PBS. Before we get started, though, some nuts and bolts would like to say a, a, and give you a friendly reminder that unlike us, and you will be glad of this, you will not be on video and we will not be able to hear or see you so you can relax there with your uh, wonderful drinks and uh, whatever state of dress or clothing you're in. But we want you uh, to know that we are looking for your questions. This is an interactive session and there is a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and uh, open that Q&A tab, type in your questions. And as always, we would love to know where you are tuning in from. So say that you're Pam from Dallas or uh, Joe from uh, Johannesburg, you'd never know. We get people internationally in these events all the time. So where you're tuning in from, your question, and uh, what, where you're watching the event, who you're watching the event with, any of those, that type of information is always interesting to everybody else as well. If you see a question that you'd like to hear the answer of, you know, it reflects what you want to hear Samantha uh, give an answer to or comment on, uh, be sure to give them the thumbs up and it's a democratic system. It will go right to the top of the Q&A and I will check it out and uh, present it to Samantha on your behalf. Now to turn on the closed captioning feature, an interesting feature that Zoom added uh, about a year ago, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and two transcript options will pop up. And we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript, of course, a sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning is sometimes slightly inaccurate and might be slightly delayed. So here we go. We're going to uh, have Samantha join us on screen in just a moment. In fact, I'm going to welcome her now. Samantha, great to have you with us here. Welcome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for having me. This is such a, a pleasurable way to spend a Tuesday night. Isn't it, especially in January? But I'm going to go through some of your life story here, Samantha, which is <laughs> okay. like a dream. We'll talk about that later. Uh, Samantha Brown was born in Dallas, Texas, but spent your formative years up in these colder northern climes, New Hampshire, in actual fact. And you write that normal travel back then was more in your parents' station wagon driving to Pennsylvania, where you have family. And, and that your idea of extensive and exotic travel was tumbling across the border to Canada for a Quebec family vacation in junior high school. But in 1999, you landed a gig hosting Travel Channel's Great Vacation Homes. And since then, you also hosted Girl Meets Hawaii, uh, Great Hotels, Passport to Europe, Passport to Latin America, Great Weekends, Green Getaways, Passport to China, Samantha Brown's Asia, all a long ways from that uh, uh, wonderful station wagon ride to Pennsylvania where everybody got along, right? <laughs> always, always. Samantha debuted your stylish line of luggage called AR4HSN. That line quickly became the customer pick, went on to be one of the top brands launched for that year. Now, in January 2018, you began hosting and producing the program that's most current that we're talking about tonight, Samantha Brown's Places to Love on PBS. Following year, the show won uh, the Emmy for Outstanding Travel Adventure Program, and you won the Emmy for Outstanding Host, not surprisingly. You currently live in Brooklyn with your husband, Kevin, who's also your tech support there, I can attest to that, <laughs> and your twin son and daughter right there in Park Slope in, in Brooklyn. Great to have you with us. I, I was really looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you you have a, a a distinct Boston accent yourself. Where where do you hail from? I can't hide it. 
I keep telling people <laughs> that I'm actually from Billerica up here and I get it to a correspondence course. <laughs> speak like an Irish guy dot com. You can you too can speak. <sighs> I it's love funny. it. I love how you sp- uh, how you pronounce B- Billerica. Like you, you, you pronounced everything. We just say Billerica. <laughs> Even the L's go out of there. It's like Billerica. Yeah, exactly. So tell us about your tell us about your New Hampshire experience. You grew up uh, up near near right around Derry. At least you went to school in Derry. We're at Pinkerton Academy, right? Exactly. Yeah, we moved to New Hampshire when I was in, I believe, the first grade. So I was about seven years old. So 1977. And let me just say WGBH has been in my life ever since. Uh, the, the GBH is where I watched Sesame Street, Electric Company, hearing Rita Ooh. Moreno scream, you hey, watch- you yeah. guys. Rita Moreno, who is, who is still around actually now. And uh, exactly. in the new West Side Story, I understand. It, actually. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, my mother would watch Julia Child. So GBH has been in my life for a very, very long time. But Grew up in New Hampshire, and then we moved to Newcastle, New Hampshire, um, which is on the seacoast. Uh, New Hampshire doesn't have a ton of, of, of seacoast, as, as Massachusetts knows, and then Maine takes it all. But that's where most of my family reside now, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and as well as York, Maine. And I still go back, of course, um, you know, many, many times during the year. And I just, I love being from New England. And someone once asked me, did you think that New Hampshire prepared you in any way for traveling around the world? How does this little state do that? And I said, absolutely, because in New Hampshire, um, uh, there is no putting on airs in New Hampshire. You accept people for who they are and uh, you never judge, uh, you, you don't judge people. You just um, accept them for who they are. And so I've always taken that sort of upbringing that I had solidly in New Hampshire and applied it everywhere I go. Well, again, as an outsider, I've loved New Hampshire and its differences, for example, with Maine and its differences with Vermont. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of an individualist state. It's the, you know, live free or die, you know, the population. Exactly. <laughs> rough, you know, the mountains, they've got to conquer it and, and, and they carry that through and they're welcome. And of course, the beauty of the state itself. You covered this in one of your programs, actually. You went back to your native New Hampshire and covered some of the, the more, the lesser known parts of it and even some of the more known parts of it in interesting ways. But Samantha, going back to your, 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 your career, starting off your career, did you, you, you were at Pinkerton Academy and then went on to Syracuse. Performing arts were in your, was, was in, your, in your blood to begin with, going through high school and college. How, just describe a little bit of the trajectory. How does that get you to being a travel writer and a television host? Sure. So I, I, I started really in junior high school. I had a wonderful teacher named Mr. Quincy, um, Mr. Quigley, sorry, Mr. Quigley. And he was my junior high school teacher. And then he moved to Pinkerton Academy as well. So I was really lucky to have uh, seven years just incredible, um, uh, uh, just uh, that, 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 that sort of teacher really guiding you along the way. And so then I went to Syracuse University for musical theater. Yes, that is a major in a college setting. And really that means you're learning how to sing, act and dance. You're being a triple threat. And uh, then when I moved to New York City, I realized I wasn't threatening at all. People are really talented when they move to New York City. It's phenomenal. You are amongst the best people in the world and you're outside listening to their audition thinking I am I am so over my head what was I thinking so I waited on tables Brian for a very long time a good almost a decade waiting on tables in New York City and I started to do a lot of sketch comedy which I loved I loved improv and sketch comedy and then um, just kind of by the way I, I, I got these commercials and I was in the commercial and the writer of the commercials then recommended me to a producer friend that he uh, knew, um, and they were creating a show that the Travel Channel had uh, commissioned, and he said, you should check her out. So they called me in, and uh, kind of the rest is history, but my audition was uh, totally improv. It was basically, here you go, here's the thing, the camera's rolling, go. And so that is what prepared me for the audition, which got me the job. And uh, so just the ability, because whenever you see a host, for the most part, although when I talked to Rick Steves, he said his, his, his show is totally scripted. My, mine is not. I mm-hmm. just do a lot of research and then I just kind of have a great conversation with people. Um, but you still do have to understand how to, um, to develop that story, to create that conversation like you're so good at, and then be able to cap it and end it. And that is something that you learn in, in improvisation. 
Absolutely. I think it's a great it's a great tool and it kind of makes perfect sense once you explain it like that. But your personality is what comes out on, on your show. And, and Rick Steves, who we've had on this, uh, the equivalent of this, what an interesting man and what an interesting background he has. And he basically meticulously goes into the history of a place, the architecture of a place. It seems to me, Samantha, and correct me if I'm wrong, that your special sauce is people. Is, is, is the people in a place really make the experience worthwhile? You seem to connect with them naturally, make friendships um, that then basically lure people into the concept of why you love that particular place. Is that fair to say? It's very fair to say, and it's not who I really started as a human being when I started to travel. I was very shy. I was very much an observer of the travel experience. I never really put myself in, you know, um, to any sort of situation. I just kind of like to watch from afar. And interestingly enough, it was um, when I went to Ireland that I realized how lovely and easy it is to just strike up a conversation with people. The Irish, everything I learned about how to being congenial and, you know, a, a good conversationalist, I learned in Ireland because literally it's just, well, how are you doing today? Oh, are you, are you talking to me? Oh, oh, well, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm doing okay. And we're just at a street corner, you know, really? waiting to cross the street. And I just thought, so a lot of times when I'm, uh, I do feel I am kind of still shy. I do feel like, okay, how do I start this conversation? I was just like, okay, pretend you're Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and talking to somebody from Ireland who's willing to do it. And I, I think, I think one is surprised as well with once you do offer somebody the entree, people are perhaps more friendly and open to conversation than even they themselves thought, which I think is an interesting discovery. Now we've got tons of questions there and uh, I want to encourage you to look at those questions. If you've got a new one, please just open the Q&A tab, add it in there. We've got tons we're going to get it onto. And if there's one that is similar to what you're in your thoughts, just vote for it and we'll get onto that in just a moment. You can watch Samantha Brown's Places to Love on Sundays at noon on GBH2. It's also on Passport. The first episode of season five aired this past Sunday, January 9th. What, what was the theme of that? I missed it, but I will catch it up on Passport, Samantha. What course, was it? Um, Asheville, North Carolina. Oh, really great, great mountain city. Great mountain and, city. And a wonderful, wonderful home of UNC Asheville, of course, and home of great music there as well. Bluegrass, Appalachian music as well, which features. Yes. And actually, we featured um, a really wonderful, uh, there's a new record producing uh, company and it takes place in an old newspaper building where in the in the um, third floor of this printing press was where uh, was a um, I forget what the call letters of where of the radio but basically pre um, a broadcast blue, um, yeah the, uh, across the eastern seaboard so wow. a lot of phenomenal history there yeah. wow it seems to me just looking at your past as well the past episodes that you're focus as well as you go to places that people otherwise wouldn't think of you do go to exotic places like Auckland New Zealand and North Korea or South Korea and Japan of course but also just your ordinary places hill country in Texas which was a beautiful mm -hmm. one and you had a personal association with that as well and just talking about things like blue bonnets like the like, like just the flowers of a place in Texas not normally what you associate with a travel show which has the whole world as, at its fingertips. But you point out that right in our backyard within driving distance or short flight distance domestically, there are places that we should check out. I, I feel for me that is so important um, that we know that, that travel, the importance of it has never been measured in miles, right? You, the, the going 10,000 miles is, is fine, but you could still have life-changing experiences on a day trip from your home. Mm -hmm. And I think this idea that travel has to be bucket list big to really matter is a false one. And it's something that we really try to I wouldn't say disprove, but we try to promote by where we do go and what we do show. I get just as excited going to the Jersey Shore as I do Xi'an, China. I really do, because it's just, what am I going to see? Who am I going to meet? What am I going to, you know, say, you know, experience? And it really does not matter where you go. You get that sense of people and place wherever. So I feel like travel can really meet us closer than, is closer than we think. 
Well, your genuine sense of exploration and your genuine enthusiasm is also what conveys that to people is that perhaps they should look closer to home and especially at these times, yes. which talking about Samantha, it's been a challenging two years for the travel industry, of course, and especially for anybody who does have a bucket list, even if that bucket list is Oregon or Maine or whatever it is, it's, it's been difficult. What, what's, what's, what's your overview of this? It's a, it's a hard one to put in a bottle, isn't it? I don't know what you're talking about, Brian. What do you mean it's been difficult? What? what it, but what, there are what? ordinary times. Like, <laughs> These are just, I don't know. I'm nothing to see here. Um, <laughs> they are or uh, extraordinary times. And I would say that even in these two years, it has become even more apparent to more people just how the local um, is an incredible place to explore. I, I feel like, you know, we... Um, you know, we, we, we lived through a time during the, you know, the real shutdown back in March of 2020, where supporting our local community was a part of our own survival. Mm. And so we really sought out the restaurants and the artists and, and we found uh, little hiking trails that we never knew were there and parks that, well, this is precious. And all of a sudden Yellowstone was our backyard and the woods close to home. And there was just a greater appreciation for things we just always took for granted. And I'm sure just the people you know watching today being from Boston, I'm sure you take it for granted that you live in one of the best cities in the world. And all of a sudden you're like, well, my gosh, I had no idea. So um, I feel that these two years, and of course we're still in it, it's still making us understand this, that you can take that sense of being a part of the community and now apply it to wherever you go, because no matter where you go, it is someone else's local. So I think that was the greatest lesson for me and what I feel like people are really um, taking with them as with their travels. Um, it, it is about having a more meaningful experience. And that really is about dialing down into what it makes a community and being a part of that as opposed to just a, a consumer. Absolutely. And, and also, again, reflecting how you uh, introduce your shows and go through these special places is just realizing that every moment is so special, even the mm -hmm. smallest one of meeting somebody or going to a place that's relatively obscure mightn't, be, mightn't even be that spectacular, but it has a special quality all of its own. I think in, in, against the backdrop of COVID, we will take those moments as being the precious nuggets that they are in our lives. I We're going to move on to some questions uh, from the audience here. Some of them are practical, some of them are more philosophical. As I'm looking, we've got one from Hudson Mass and a lot of people interested in this, of course, against, again, what we talked about the last two years, the ins and outs are kind of just some nuggets of advice on travel insurance these days, a very practical question, but yeah. one that's foremost in people's minds as, as flights are canceled, as plans change, et cetera, et cetera. Any tidbits of advice on travel insurance? Sure. I, I think if you are spending a lot of money on that trip, if you are going overseas and it's a big trip um, with your family or something that you've saved a lot for, um, uh, travel insurance is very, uh, I, I would get it, absolutely. I would make sure that it involved some sort of medical insurance and a lot of destinations, especially in the Caribbean, are already kind of baking that into the price. There's a tax that you have to pay and that real tax is, goes into, should you get sick, you are taken care of. Um, uh, a place will be there for you for your 10 day stay of if you need to quarantine. So um, absolutely look into that. And with um, uh, any sort of, of, of insurance, you know, there's the cancel for any reason insurance, which is, I feel like, a little too pricey. <laughs> um, it's usually like a third of the trip um, and you don't get that back uh, even. I mean, you don't, even if something goes wrong, you don't get all your money back. So nothing is a hundred percent guarantee. So maybe that's another good thing to go in as you're mulling over insurance. You're not going to get a hundred percent of it back. So um, judge what your, the uncertainty is and how you can build insurance around that. It's like anything in life. I think you're betting against risk and what your risk tolerance is as well, yeah, you know, yeah. but, but, but helping uh, wade through that as well as is, is, mm -hmm. is also getting some advice from somebody who's more expertise as, as the landscape continues to change. Somebody joining us, uh, Carla from Rhode Island, interested in traveling to Portugal this year, one of my favorite places to travel. Uh, recommendation for traveling during the pandemic, generally speaking, this is a general question, but I know a lot of our 
our viewers tonight, those joining us are interested in. There, she is interested in visiting the Algarve and Lisbon and Madeira specifically, which is one of the islands, right? Um, but basically, what, are you, what is your general recommendation about traveling at this time of COVID? Uh, go. <laughs> I think again, it really, it really depends. When, when, when the the person who asked the question, when are they going this summer? This summer, yeah. So things oh. could be very different this summer, right? Oh, I, uh, it's going to probably be a lot better. I, I would think. I mean, we we already have two summers to inform us, and even the summer of 2020 was actually pretty good. We couldn't go anywhere foreign, um, but people who stayed within the United States still had a a, a really good time. And then um, this past summer. Europe really opened up and everything was fine. And even though the Delta variant, I remember I was in France when the Delta variant hit and all of a sudden was like, oh my goodness, um, okay, here we go. Uh, you're outside for everything, and especially in Portugal at that time in the summer, you know, the, the, the concern is to catch it and then not to be able to come home right away, right? I think that's, for me, that was the biggest concern. What if I have COVID and now I have to quarantine for 10 days? But the good news is you're going to be spending most of your time outdoors. So I wouldn't have that concern. You would be amazed how just normal everything is. Um, people, I do wear a mask. People are asking you to wear a mask. Obviously you should be vaccinated. You should be uh, boosted and ready to go and follow the protocols and you will be fine. There's a lot of other really great um, things happening because of COVID where museums now have timed entries. This is brilliant. Now I don't have to duke it out with 400 people in a line and get smashed up against walls to kind of see paintings. Like they, sp you know, they, they space things out. So make sure you know that if there are any of these big, maybe more historical places that if there is a timed entry, you're planning ahead for that and make room for that in your schedule. And you're already doing a really great thing in that you're staying within one country. What I would not recommend right now for people looking to go abroad um, in the summer, which is usually when people are heading to Europe, is doing a multi-country uh, trip. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, you know, because because countries change in terms of what they want, what, what they want to see, and they change on a dime. <laughs> and if you're traveling from Spain and all of a sudden Spain changes the protocols to get into France, well, then you're caught in between that. So if you stay in one country, you're going to be able to travel pretty easily within that country. And so I think you're already making it easy for you. And, and that a lot of that un uncertainty you're taking away. That is great advice. But I think I want to go back to your first advice. Your first bit of advice is go. So you're, oh. I think you would be tagged as a, as a glass half full type person. Uh, just what oh. we needed, Samantha, on this uh, cold January night here in Boston, actually. Bridget, Listen, if this is the time. Yeah. And this is the time. If you can travel again, there are people who are, who are like we as a travel uh, uh, production company might not be going to Europe just yet because I've got eight people I need to be responsible for. That really changes things up. But if it's you and a partner or you and a friend or maybe just you solo, oh, the world is your oyster. <laughs> Take advantage. And there's definitely this feeling of Europeans or people when we travel that you made it. Oh my gosh, you're here. So it is a it's a, it's a great time to travel. <laughs> I think. Absolutely. Vaccinated and boosted, as somebody is writing yes. here as well. Yes. They're vaccinated and boosted. A lot of talks of vaccine passports, which in Europe are a little bit more advanced than they are in the US. Is it secure right now to apply for an international one of these and just get up and go? Uh, it would seem to me from what you just said, you would say, yes, just do whatever you can. Make sure your, your vaccine cards are up to date, you're boosted and take proof of that. I think they accept that in most countries these days, right? What we have in the US. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have, it's so strange that that vaccine card that you write things on is, is the gold standard. <laughs> this little card that can be so counterfeited, it's strange. But I understand there's a lot of reticence with having all of your personal information on an app. For me, I don't care. I gave up, I gave all my, my information to global entry. I just want to get through a line. I want to get home. So whatever you need to know about me, go for it. But what, whatever, whatever you can do to make things a little um, easier, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, we are talking with Samantha Brown about wonderful series that she has on that's mm -hmm. on now on Sundays on 
GVH, GVH2, the first episode of season five aired this past Sunday. Isn't it wonderful that you can time shift? I missed that particular one and we'll go and, li- and, and watch it again. But all of your programming, and it doesn't go out of date really, Samantha, this is great about your series. You can go back to the very first series that you broadcast and, and, and basically it's there, nuggets of information, advice that doesn't change over over many, many years. What would be one of your most memorable programs? If you were to say, there's one program I really remember and I, I think about it before going to sleep at night, it was so special. What would that program be? Um, I loved our Xi'an China. Um, and that is actually the episode where we won the Emmy for, um, for best travel series. And it was our first season. And why I loved it. it. What, what, what happened there? Was there something special happened or was it just the area generally? Yes, well, I mean, I love China. I, I just love feeling totally out of my comfort zone. Um, but I had been there 10 years before to film an episode. And we it was interesting to come back to a, a city in China that just exploded even more. Everyone going to Xi'an China is there to see the terracotta warriors. That's what you see, this incredible, you know, uh, you know, arche- uh, just uh, archaeological feat. Um, and when 10 years ago, our whole approach to places to love is to not just understand the historical importance of something, but what it means to the people now. Well, what what does all this mean when you go to see the terracotta warriors? And so we hear about the history of it and that it was these, you know, warriors were created 5,000 years ago and buried like a mausoleum. Um, but I wanted to know, well, what do the people here feel about that? What, what does it mean that this was the birth of China? And finding that person to tell us that's tough. That's where I think like our producers really come in. We spent a tremendous amount of effort finding the people who can be really good carriers and good storytellers. It's a lot more challenging when there's a language barrier. Um, but we found an amazing a doctor who had been working there for 20 years and it was his job to be there in that pit, you know, with a little tiny brush and slowly he would see an eye and then realize he had something and just talking to him how he felt about, I feel like they're telling me stories and they're here to say hello whenever Mm. I, and it's just, it just made you feel just, just magic. And we really just got to know people there. Um, And, um, and just how um, uh, incredible, I mean, it's an ancient place uh, with an incredible uh, um, Muslim uh, influence and Chinese influence. And um, it's really incredible to be in a place where boy, I don't understand a lot what's going on, but we're still connecting with people and it's, it's pretty powerful. Absolutely, connecting with people being, being a key element again of what you do, that is your special sauce in the program throughout is that human connection and, and the interest levels that are there. Is that something that you think in a, say, moving back to domestic or even international travel, it's a very important thing to, to maintain, isn't it? There's those human connections and those explorations into history, into culture. Right here in our country, you regularly move around and have in the past, you've done, in addition to the exotic Chinese travel that you just talked about, you go to Oregon, you move up to Montreal, you go down to Lafayette, Louisiana. How important is it for Americans, especially in this divided state, to travel around and see people in their own environments? As we seem to be pulling apart at the seams, a lot of your programming seems to emphasize the humanity in everybody, even from areas of this country that are very different from others. Well, you hit the nail on the head, Brian. I mean, I'm, I'm a human being myself and spending these last two years and certainly last year, beginning with January 6th, really questioning, oh my goodness, what, what, is, what is happening? What is happening with us? We, we are definitely a country that needs to connect more. And we don't, that doesn't mean we have to agree with each other, but we can't go to battle stations every time. And we've become like fervent in our tribalism. And um, it's something that when I watch the news, I just feel like we are so divided. But whenever I travel, I realize how wrong that is to feel. We are not. Um, We have so much um, passion to give. We, We, as a country, have a phenomenal amount of diversity and stories that haven't been told yet that are still um, still there to be told. In our Boston episode, which is our very last episode of season five, 
Um, of course, we talk about the Paul Revere and uh, we go to um, the Old South Meeting House to understand that fervor that happened. And then they went down to the, you know, the, the harbor and they dumped all the tea. Mm -hmm. But then we also talked to a, a man named Colin Knight, who um, founded Live Like a Local Tours. And he takes us around Rochester and I'm sorry, um, uh, Roxbury and Dorchester and tells us about the history of that neighborhood, that community, that it was uh, just a, 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 an epicenter of civil rights. Malcolm X lived there, uh, Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King lived there, and he tells that story. And he tells how Martin Luther King wanted to live in um, Roxbury as opposed to on the campus of BU. And we're getting these stories and these are stories, I grew up in New Hampshire, I didn't hear these stories. Roxbury wasn't a place you went to, but now it is. And now when you are there with the people who have been brought up there and they are talking about the diversity there and just the food and now they're brewing beer there, um, you just realize just the layers that we've been missing. And it's not something to be um, fearful of. It's something to embrace that we have so many more, Boston has so many more stories to tell and there are people who are telling it. And so it's my job, and this is where I'm really excited about season five, it is to listen to people and it is to listen to, um, to understand, not just to respond. And that's what's happening. Um, that's what I wish most Americans would understand is that this ability to have a conversation we are losing that ability. And when we travel is where we get it back. When Absolutely. we travel is where we open our mind and we, are, we allow ourselves to learn different perspectives and histories and we enjoy it. So that's, that's, the, that's travel, why it is so important today, especially now in this country. It's more than just a travel writer and a host of a television show. You are, Samantha, as well. You're, you're, you're kind of saying that as a philosopher, there's a philosophy in, involved in your life. Obviously, you've developed that over the years of doing this as well and traveling around the world. And Michelle from Montclair says, I want Samantha's life. Of course we do. <laughs> How can I transition into traveling for a living? I don't need to be in front of the camera. I just want to get to see more of the world. So when you were growing up, when you were doing your performing arts gig, your improv, did you dream that this would be your life down the line? Never, never. I have realized I never dreamed. I, I didn't dream big enough, right? Um, I never thought I would travel. For me, travel was literally going to Canada went before you needed a passport um, and, um, and Pennsylvania to see relatives. And that was it. I never realized I would be able to um, connect with the world uh, in the way I have. I am truly very lucky. Very, very, very lucky. Tell us about the series coming up. We, we started just uh, this last uh, uh, Sunday. It's a, on Sundays here on GBH and on Passport, nice. and it ends with a Boston episode. Tell us about the other epi episodes in between, one line on each place that you're visiting. Um, so we've got Asheville, North Carolina. You've got some of the Not oldest mountains in the world creating mm -hmm. this mountain mythology and a creativity that just can't, can't, has no peril, uh, parallel. And uh, then second, we have uh, Jersey Shore and more, learning a lot more about the Jersey Shore in terms of, of the abolitionist movement. Harriet Tubman uh, lived in Cape May and they just opened up a Harriet Tubman Museum to rocking out with Bruce, Bing, Brings, uh, Bruce Springsteen's famous photographer, uh, Danny Clinch. Um, Houston, Texas, I go back to that city. We, that was our very first episode of season one. And we decided to return because we just knew there was so much more to show of one of the most, I'm sorry, the most diverse city in the United States. There is no one majority. So we wanted to showcase that again. Um, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, horses and bourbon and Muhammad Ali, you can't go wrong. Uh, we also yeah. went to, one of my favorite episodes was, um, is, sorry, um, coming up in a few weeks, Genesee River Valley. And that's in the Finger Lakes of upstate New York. And we just understand how even rural uh, upstate New York, a rural America can be pockets and just um, this new movement of diversity that is absolutely fascinating. Um, then we went to Colorado Springs to really celebrate the Olympics. They just opened up the uh, Olympic and Paralympic Museum there. Uh, there's also uh, the Wolf Center where they um, really want to educate people on the benefits of wolves. And you can be there. You can actually get into an environment with the wolf. Um, 
San Antonio, Texas, a uh, great city. They're doing phenomenal things with their river, uh, which I know people will be. I know, San Antonio is just one of those places where people love to go to. If you haven't been there in five years, you haven't been there. It's just incredible Change. changes. And wow. then last but not least, Boston, Massachusetts. That's our finale. Which we will very much look forward to. Bostonians love hearing about themselves, especially if they're getting a thumbs up somewhere along the line. <laughs> I give you a big thumbs up. <laughs> two, two, two thumbs up from Samantha. That is really great. We're going to come back and take more of your questions. But first, I want to ha hand you over to my colleague here, Jamie Reese, who's going to talk a little bit about PBS, about GBH, and about your support of public broadcasting. What would we do, Jamie, in this day and age, and particularly uh, during this time of a pandemic? What would we possibly do without public broadcasting? I think we'd be very bored. Seriously. Yes, and uh, we really wouldn't know what's going on in the world because I know that, that that's one reason why I rely on GBH, coverage I can count on every day, right, Brian? 100% news and information and also uh, people like Samantha who are just, as I said, not just travel guides, but philosophers really how to live our lives and how to open up our eyes and ears to what's happening around us. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of, of Miss Brown and I'm so glad she could join us today. <laughs> So um, I guess I should go on. I have a special message for everybody joining us at home. First, thanks so much for joining us tonight, everyone, during this special event. You know, viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to watch their favorite TV host or radio host in action, to travel via TV to their favorite places, or to hear fact-based journalism. If you rely on GBH for news you can trust, and programs that educate, entertain, and inspire, we hope you'll decide to make a donation and become one of our GBH members. We have a special gift in mind for event guests who become GBH members tonight. Support GBH at $10 a month and receive two, not one, but two new thank you gifts. And those are the GBH Fanny Pack, and a GBH umbrella. The fanny pack, you can see it pictured behind me. It's royal blue with our GBH logo in white. The umbrella is also blue with the GBH logo and the phrase coverage you can count on. Show you're a fan of GBH wherever life takes you, whether it's in your backyard, across the country, or across the world. You can take these items with you. We also have other travel gifts to send to from wireless chargers to beach bags. The choice is completely yours when you make a donation. So you can select your gift of choice when you visit gbh.org slash support events. Giving is as simple as it is secure. Just click on the link you see in the chat tab now or text the letters GBH to 800-204-3811. Or you can scan the QR code pictured on the screen to my right. The amount of money our supporters give is directly to, related to the amount of travel programs and other great programs uh, people turn to on GBH. So every dollar truly, truly does make a difference and that's why your support is so important. Uh, so thanks for listening, everyone. We hope you'll become part of the action, become a member. And now back to Brian and our special guest, Samantha Brown. Thanks so much, Jamie. And all Jamie's uh, sentiments, they're very important to all of us here at GBH. And I know I speak for anybody associated with PBS as well, is that we feel as if we're keepers of a public trust here rather than just employees. This is really your station, your public broadcasting service and system. And we're certainly lucky to have it. Lots of questions coming in, Samantha. You're, you're extraordinarily popular tonight for good reason. You open up <laughs> the, the, the horizons of everybody. You, you give us hope that there are things ahead of us, exciting things to do. I know that there's a pent up demand for travel that's going to happen when it's safe to do so. And you are saying that it is, you know, travel with, with protocols in mind, with vaccinations and boosters in mind, and that there is reason to believe that we will be out there again, meeting the people of the world and expanding our horizons in, in very, very human ways. And um, so we're going to do very quick, a couple of, uh, of quick questions here, very quick answers. Where would you retire in the US? 
Joanne is asking us from Rhode Island, I believe. Um, either uh, Kittery, Maine, because I love Maine, or something completely different, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Whoa, I've heard so many good things about Santa Fe and never been there. They, now they're two very different places. Yeah, I think Santa Fe is probably more expensive too. Santa Fe is an expensive place, so maybe that shouldn't be where I retire. But Santa Fe is really an interesting place in the United States in that it has a beautiful confluence of cultures. You have Native American that go back 10,000 years. You have the Spanish, of course, and then you just have American. And they play out in really great ways. They are phenomenal art, great margaritas, wonderful access to the outdoors. So it's really a, a really lovely place. I can understand why it's uh, such a popular place to go. There are many, uh, many boutique uh, travel companies out there. We're getting a lot of uh, folks interested in Kathy from Lemonsters uh, ask, is any experience with Road Scholar? I've just heard anecdotally that they're a very good organization that does wonderful experiential travel. I, I, I have not, I, we don't do, toy, like I don't really, um, uh, yes. Uh, interact with tours because we do our own production, but I would say they are one of the most reputable tour companies in the United States, bar none. Absolutely. I think they're the whole reason why they, their whole founding story is really wonderful. I mean, they're just a good group of people to take a trip with. So I would just, but based on my anecdotal adv uh, advice and what I've heard uh, on the streets, um, yeah, it's a great company. Laurie is asking, what are your thoughts on the safety of cruise travel? That's a tough one these days. You know, it is, and um, but I would say you know, what the, what's kind of unfair to the cruise industry is that they're the only ones who have to report diseases on board, right? Um, resorts don't have to. So there's probably just as many things going on in resorts or hotels or the airlines, restaurants. The cruise lines are the only company based on, you know, the, um, the FDA who has to report diseases on board. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's kind of a bit unfair, I feel. Um, but I think what's, you're, what you're seeing right now is that um, a lot of people who are avid cruisers are still cruising. They're still out there. They, they understand it. And if you're new to cruising, maybe not, now's not the time. That's the great thing about travel. If you have any trepidation or uncertainty, just wait a year, do something else, do something that's in more in your comfort zone. It'll be there when you when you come back, there's no reason to stress out um, overtly so about travel. Of course, there's always amount of uncertainty. There's always a reason of thinking, oh, something's not going to work. But if it's you're the best person to understand if that is at a level that's that's OK and manageable or you're just going to be stressed out the entire time until you leave. And then it's going to take you. You're not going to be able to even enjoy the trip. Think about that. If that's how you are, just don't take the trip right now. That's such great advice because I, I have certainly even, even being from Europe, I have put off all of my trips, not on the basis of, of safety fears, but largely on the basis of it being too fraught, either the travel experience or yeah, my yeah. inability to visit casually with, with, with friends and family. But I honestly say, inspired by you tonight, I'm gonna to make a slight adjustment to that and say, just go. I can still hear you saying that it'll be ringing just, my ears long go. after we're off the conversation. Just go. Do it safely, but just go. Yeah. What are the places, Sam is asking, what are the places that have especially surprised you? Is there one there that you haven't? And is there one, two things? What if it's one place that has especially surprised you that you didn't expect and a place that you haven't been yet that you really want to go? Sam from Ipswich. Oh. Boy, um, a place that surprised me was um, Cambodia. Uh, and when I, we were there, I was so surprised how um, just friendly. Well, actually, Brian, I always say that the, the people of Cambodia are, are the Irish of Southeast Asia. Really? Um, incredibly incredible. talkative, lovely. Um, they, there's a tremendous reciprocity in terms of wanting to get to know them and they want to get to know us. And um, I just, I loved being there. And you go there to see Angkor Wat and incredible, you know, archeological finds, but really what you'd find is um, just this great connection to people and, and just being in almost an exotic location, but just also mm -hmm. it feeling familiar. So I would say Cambodia, a place I haven't gone to, oh my gosh. I mean, I haven't done really anything in Africa except Cape Town. Um, there's so much I would like to see. I'd love to do the Aurora Borealis. That's my dream. Mm. That's my dream to see um, the Northern Lights. So those two places, again, very opposite. <laughs> I guess I'm an opposite day, but um, but yeah, so to see the, the Northern Lights. So hopefully like maybe like a Finland or 
um, uh, somewhere uh, somewhere up there, Alaska maybe too. Beth uh, from Delaware is asking, uh, instead of going all the way to Europe, is a quick trip, I, I somehow I think I know this answer, is a quick trip to Quebec a good alternative? And how many days are enough to go to Quebec? Of course, Quebec the province, and you've got Quebec the, the city as well. Um, well. How would you answer the, uh, Beth uh, in terms of advising her on a good Canadian trip to French it's a Canada. great idea. Absolutely great idea. And I would even say Montreal uh, is another very good idea in terms of getting that fix. In fact, when I go to Quebec or Montreal, even though it's a two hour flight, when I land, I feel jet lag. And that just gives you an idea of how much like in Europe it is. You just feel like, wow, I'm in Europe and, and all the, just what you see. And, and you're like, I should, I should be exhausted right now. It should be, but it was just a quick trip and it's the same, uh, relatively the same time zone, but uh, absolutely. You've got um, a, a definite European flair uh, in both of those cases. What's the best, most reliable source or website to find a nice villa to rent for a week or two in Tuscany? Esther, oh, asking. I don't know, but if you have it, tell me. I, I don't know that. about villas. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, you've got your VRBOs. They do, they do villas. Uh, I'm not sure about Airbnb, but Verbo would have that. And um you know, the good news about booking through them is that maybe it would be more of a, a protection of your money. You know, you just want to be careful, right? If you're renting someone's house, that's all in the up and up. So um, I would I would look into what, what works really well here and around the world, which is Verbo. Tell us about your, your kids, Samantha. You've got you've got twins, right? I do, yes. Uh, they oh. turn nine next week, wow. which is incredible. Uh, they are wonderful travelers, um, as as you can imagine. They're very lucky where they've been able to travel with me. I do take them to work sometimes, and um, yeah, yeah, they're 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 looking forward to getting back to travel. They do miss it. And is there one? What, what kind of advice would you if traveling with kids that age or younger? Obviously, you've been through that. So you've been traveling with kids since they were three and up to nine. So mm -hmm. what 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 do you advise people to look for when they're traveling with kids of that age? So when we travel and we've traveled all over Europe as well as um, we were in Hong Kong as well as South Korea with our uh, at the time four and five year olds. Um, the it changes a lot what you think you can do with kids um, as an adult take at least two things do one thing in the morning and one thing in the evening and a nap is always important uh, a break um, you can't keep going with kids and you also will need uh, actually i find that people who are five and 95 have a similar disposition everyone is tired by three so just don't push it um, another thing we do with our kids is we don't stay in the city centers we make a point to actually stay in neighborhoods next, next to parks and parks with playgrounds. And especially in Europe, oh my gosh, the, um, the quality of life that is there for children, the playgrounds that are totally free. And then you meet parents and they speak a little English and then you can find out about places to go through, through them. Um, another thing I always did with my son when we were going throughout France and, um, and Germany, and he had had it with castles. He basically said, no more castles. And so I'm like, I get that. We, I would just look at a Google map and I would look for a green space. And then I would look for a blue rectangle space. And that meant that's a pool. And Europe uh, pools in Europe are phenomenal. For like three Euro, you get this great pool, water slides, and you get that the whole day. And we would just spend the whole day there, um, hours. And then we would go back to our hotel. So I would make sure if I was a family, I would be more where families live as opposed to downtown. I just think that's wonderful advice. I have raised, I've got four grown kids myself. And I remember making the mistake one time of taking them you know, on the, on the required trip to Disney and just trying <laughs> to fit everything. And I bought a book saying how to maximize Disney. Yes, By the yes. end of the... By the end of the first day, we were all in tears, literally. Okay. And we just totally abandoned that completely. And they stayed in one area of the resort and enjoyed a pool. And we did one other activity and everything was fine. Your point is bring the kids to those countries, have them enjoy the same things you're enjoying, interact with other kids, go to yes, restaurants, yes. do one activity or two activities a day, make them light and just, just basically don't try to cram in too much. I think it's terrific advice. Yeah. 
And can I give one more piece of advice that um, you don't hear a lot that is really people, uh, especially nor, uh, uh, new parents. And if you have uh, children who have young kids, this is great advice to pass down to them. Um, the airport just strikes fear in most new parents, especially with young children. Um, avoid the pre-board. So all airlines give you, if you have three or under or two or under kids, um, the pre-board. Don't do it. Better, uh, the better idea is to divide and conquer. Uh, you know, parent number one or caregiver number one uses that pre-board to load everything in, whether you've got car seats or luggage, you secure your overhead bin spa uh, space. Parent number two, that's usually me, I wait with my kids until the very last zone and that very last person gets into line. In the meantime, I'm running around, maybe I'm hitting a balloon, balloons don't go far, you can hit, they can run, they jump. We get in line at the very last minute, walk onto the plane, put them in their car seats, the plane leaves in 10 minutes. The problem with the pre-board is that in your entire travel experience, that pre-board is the most stressful point of anyone's trip. Adults are terrible, right? We're stress bombs. You know, big luggage is going over these little tiny heads, right? And it's so much stress that adults can feel it and we're not even handling it well. And then that child gets to a cruising altitude of 30,000 feet and they just release it, right? And so, and we all wonder why this child is crying. And we as adults can't even handle being in a plane. So just try to remove young children as much as you possibly can from that. Samantha, can I recommend, maybe you have done so already, can you write a book on this? Can you do an <laughs> sure, episode on this? This is gold. This is a golden yeah. nugget of advice out there. I know a lot of people, parents, grandparents, yes. I'm a grandparent now, and that's, that's great advice. You should, you should definitely do that if you haven't done so already. Obviously, or you've got a lot of experience with your nine-year-old. Yes. <laughs> a lot of, uh, of uh, hands-on, um, uh, just learn, from, learn it the hard way experience, that's for sure. So I we're running out of time and we have so many questions to get there that oh, sorry, I'm not sorry. going to get there. So I am going to ask you a question here. Give me a recommendation. Three different areas that I'm going to ask you. One is a warm weather, one week getaway. And I'm saying this from a guy that's freezing here in, in, in Boston at the moment. A one week yes. getaway, a warm weather uh, recommendation. Um, make it easy, direct flight to anywhere in Florida, or you can go to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is a beautiful place. You also get a nice European feel as well with old San Juan uh, beaches. If you go to Calabria in Puerto Rico, you have beaches as beautiful as Thailand. So you, you hit two checks with that one destination. Puerto Rico is fantastic. Again, easy flight from Boston, Massachusetts. Your, your next one, next question is, is someplace that has a real, real deep history. I'm a history buff and I want to go to one place. I, oh. I can only go to one place right now in the next year. Where would you recommend? Like someplace like, you know, like a Normandy, for example. Oh, you... sure. Yeah. I mean, if the world's our oyster, I mean, well, I mean, I guess we can't go to China yet. That's where it really is incredible. Um, oh, my gosh. The... You know what I loved? I, I loved because growing up in New England, uh, I'm going to keep it local. I'm going to keep it within the United States um, at like San Antonio and Texas and understanding about the missions and the Spanish who came over. It's a very different history than we get taught in New England. It's all about, you know, the pilgrims coming over and the colonists and, and Boston and, and Philadelphia. And there's this all other history. Um, so I would say that every place has a history. I feel like in New England, we kind of get a little egocentric with our history and think that that's it for American history. But if you go anywhere outside of like Texas or even California and the missions, it's fascinating or learning how the Chinese, how they contributed to this country with the railroads in California. You can seek out um, really um, just kind of odd, never, not, I wouldn't say odd, but just really fascinating history that's not told in the United States in our books because we spend so much time on the Revolutionary War. Absolutely, and, and how history is taught. And that's, that's really, really great advice as well. And, and, and last one for you is food, or somebody wants a real culinary, a real gourmet experience. Relatively easy to get to. Again, given where we are, what would you suggest? Oh my gosh. Can I give you a hint by, by the yeah, way? Yeah, yeah, right. What do you like? Well, I just, I loved your, your, uh, your treatment of Lafayette, Louisiana, for oh, example. Sure. I loved your, your, your kind of delving into that culture, that French uh, specifically and, and peculiarly uh, New Orleans uh, type or Louisiana type French cuisine and music and everything that goes along with it. 
Absolutely. You know, you've got this whole, you know, a group of Cajuns who they say, you know, what, what the thing about we don't have zoos is because it's, everything's on the menu. <laughs> so it's also a recipe. Um, right. With the with the crawfish. Um, again, there's a there's a culture around that. Right. When you're there and you're enjoying um, a, a seafood or actually, I'm sorry, it's not seafood crawfish. It looks a lot like um, our seafood. But yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Louisiana, um, of course, New Orleans and Lafayette are great places to go. But food, you know, food is, is gosh, it's, fan, you know, it's just fantastic. You can experience amazing food everywhere now. Um, one of my favorite places is Kittery, Maine. That's, that's a great, I, I haven't done a, um, an episode there yet where we really focus on that. But from um, the Seacoast restaurants to like really high end, really, um, uh, I won't say high end, sorry, because it's not expensive, but just they're doing phenomenal things there um, that I just would love. So. And you, uh, useful and adventures of people just setting up new restaurants. As you said, brew pubs, that's happening all over the U.S. and it's mm -hmm. happening all over the world as well. Supporting them is a very important thing. So plan your travel. Again, I'm, I'm going back to what Samantha said earlier on. Just go. When you can manage your risk yeah. levels, protect yourself wherever you possibly can, follow the local pro protocols. Most importantly, get vaxxed and boosted and make sure they're all up to, up to snuff, but then go enjoy it, meet the people, and we will get through this together. Samantha, it's really been just wonderful chatting with you. Um, if I can just give advice to folks out there as well, there is a wonderful website. Just search Samantha Brown's Places to Love and you will come to a treasure trove of past episodes right online that you can watch. And uh, they're, they're kind of like a, a source book. For one thing, they'll inspire you to go and travel, but they're also a, a source of information and advice and recommendations and indeed philosophy that last uh, through the ages and will continue to do so. It, uh, season five is on right now on GBH on Sundays, Sunday afternoons, and it is also on Passport. I'm looking forward to the next uh, episodes as you described them culminating in Boston. Can't wait for that. Lots more to come, Samantha. It sounds like you have no intention of going anywhere. Actually, you have, you have every intention of going everywhere, I should say. So yeah, that's... Yeah, the season, start, season six starts in March, which is early because there's such a pent up demand of getting to places. So, wow. so um, you've, yeah. been doing this, you've been doing this even during the pandemic. You've been traveling and, and filming. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Wow. So we filmed our whole season five during the pandemic once once we were vaccinated and it felt OK. And uh, so, yeah, so we did. A, we've done a lot of travel during the pandemic and shooting. Well, let's, let's let's make this an official invitation to please come back with us because we've got so many people who are interested in chatting with you again. It's been delightful for me. Thank you on behalf of all of us uh, listening in tonight, tuning in tonight. Sorry, I didn't get to all your questions. We're going to ask Jamie Reese to come back and join us uh, online. But Samantha, maybe we'll cross paths in Brooklyn. Good luck with all your travels and thanks for what you do. It's been a wonderful hour, Brian. Thank you. Hey, Jamie. Jamie's Hi again. Her, Jamie's got her passport out. She's got her credit card out. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> Soon yes. as I can. Um, so, hey, everyone at home, it's it's Jamie again from GBH's member engagement team with one last call for your support. So if you're able to give $10 a month or $120 all at once, we would be so happy to send you not one, but two thank you gifts, perfect for life on the go. And those thank you gifts are a GBH umbrella and the new GBH fanny pack. So you can carry the essentials in your fanny pack and keep protected from the elements with our umbrella. The umbrella is sturdy, but also lightweight and wind resistant. The fanny pack has two zippered compartments and the strap is adjustable. So you can choose to either wear it around your waist or across your shoulder. So like I said before, you can really show everyone in the world you're a fan of GBH when you have the fanny pack and the umbrella with you. We have other travel items to send to to show our appreciation from wireless chargers to beach bags and more. Um, so just check it out, the choice is yours. And if you're wondering how to make a donation, I'd be happy to share with that info with you too. The answer is simple and we're also providing it in the chat tab right now. Just click on the link you see in the chat tab or text the letters GBH, that's GBH to 800-204-3811 
That's 800-204-3811. Or you can scan this beautiful QR code to my right. If you're already a member, um, on behalf of myself and all of my colleagues at GBH, we really thank you sincerely for your support. And I wish everyone happy and safe future travels to your favorite places. Thanks, Jamie. It's absolutely wonderful to have events like this at our fingertips. They are indeed inspiring, as many of our uh, listeners and viewers are watching in tonight. Samantha, thanks for your optimism. Thanks for your enthusiasm and your encouragement to just go out there and travel and keep, uh, as I said, all of our eyes and ears, and perhaps more importantly than ever in the face of what we're going through, our humanity just open to new uh, stimuli, new people to meet and places to go. Uh, I, feel, I, I sound like Dr. Seuss now, all the places you will go, but uh, it's not a bad thing. Um, look for, looking forward to watching uh, your, your wonderful season five coming up on GBH and on the PBS Passport. Again, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you.